Welcome back, everyone. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. Yes, we do. We want to quickly thank our donors, YouTube members, and our patrons over on Patreon. We really do feel and appreciate your support. Yes, today we are back at it with our fresh eyes on Sister Wives yes. for season 12. And before we get going, I apologize for my voice. I've been sick all week. So it's been a doozy. Yeah. So I'm apologize. I don't sound anything like myself, yeah. but we'll get through this. So <laughs> yes, uh, this this episode or no, this season was a long one for any of you that have not seen season 12. Just prepare a lot of time to watch that one well i wonder if all the seasons moving forward are like you know when the seasons when the show first started it was like 20 minute episodes mm -hmm. obviously they're like testing out whether or not people are going to like them right and then there was like some 42 and then it was 42 and then most of this season was like an hour and a half episodes like all the way through i think until right. the tell all so it was a lot more it was content. a lot but hey, it gave us a lot to talk about. So I guess that's a good thing, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. There were definitely some like very big things that happened in all that time. Mm -hmm. So the first big thing or one of the main topics was Tony and McKelty's wedding yes. in St. George, watching Tony's parents and family meet the Brown family and like... <laughs> I don't know, just the whole like joining of those two families was comical Tony's, in a lot of ways. Tony is he is a character. He's he's funny. So he brought a whole lot to the family, uh, which is you know, that's saying something considering how much is already there in the Brown family. But uh but yeah, it seems like they're very happy and they do really well together, I would say, him and McKelty. So the only I feel so bad for them because I feel like when Maddie and Caleb were together and getting oh. ready for their wedding and everything, like everybody was just so accepting and it makes perfect sense. And everyone can just picture Caleb. And then Tony had to prove himself for so long. They did decide to get to do the December wedding, just like what Cody wanted. And then still, I feel like along the way, they kept being like, Oh, okay. Oh, wow. They really do know each other. Oh, wow. They actually do know each other. Oh, mm. wow. Tony really does love her. Oh, wow. McKelty. Like, it kept being shocking to people. And then all the adults cat, like kind of kept feeling guilty about how they had reacted. So they're all like, I want to do this for McKelty because I felt so bad about how I was. Yeah. I'm going to do this for McKelty because I feel so bad about, you know, not understanding that they were in love and stuff. So right. I felt like they had to like prove themselves Big time. More Bo than like anybody yeah. else, which was kind of, I don't know, kind of weird. Yeah. And I, I've said this before. I think a big part of it was just the lack of communication between McKelty and Christine. Yeah. Just it, it didn't seem like Christine knew anything about him. And so because there wasn't that communication and I guess maybe possibly lack of excitement shared towards the mom, right? Maybe yeah. that's what it seemed like to me. That's the main reason. Yeah, they did a lot of untraditional things, which was hilarious, or some things that were traditional to Tony's family. You know, but like Tony going to go dress shopping with McKelty. Yeah. Um, that... Like super untraditional, which is funny because like his family had like a lot of traditions and he grew up Catholic, mm. which has a lot of traditions with it too. And it was just kind of funny to watch them be like, no, like we want pinatas. We want to beat the crap out of each other. Um, not just pinatas <laughs> that look like them. And then so so he would beat a pinata that looked like McKelty and she would beat one that looked like him. I am very curious if any of you are familiar with where that tradition came from. I mean, yes, we can do Google searches and a million different things will pop up. But someone that has experience in tradition and, and heritage doing that type of thing. Yeah, I'm curious where it came from. Anyone else from. do that? Like, has anybody else out there done this, yeah. or was this like a purely Tony Their and family. McKelty thing? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was beautiful at the end, even though it was freezing cold. Which in St. George, like people, it's hard to explain. Like winters in St. George, Utah, like it's not like the temperatures get mm. super cold, and it's right. kind of the same in Vegas. It's not the temperatures themselves because it is so dry. It's a different kind of cold. And then when the wind goes, it's like all the way to your bone chilling cold. Right. When the wind blows, it's So when they're like, oh, it's really 40 cold. degrees. Well, like 40 degrees in northern Utah is like you can be out in a 
if it's sunny, you're like, oh, okay, whatever. It's not a big deal. Right. But like 40 degrees in St. George and with the breeze, oh my gosh, you're going to die. Yeah. So they were all freezing and that made family pictures and everything, you know, interesting. But Kelty, you know, she was brave though. She wore her wedding dress, the sleeveless uh, wedding dress out there in the cold and didn't seem to be phased by it. But it was her big day. I'm sure she had a lot more on her mind than the temperature. Yes, and Tony giving his jacket during the ceremony was right. super sweet yeah. too. So overall, they're married now. So that was fun to watch and watch Tony interact. I think it was in the tell-all. He was describing his relationships with all of his mother-in-laws. <laughs> yeah, and it yeah. was so funny. Like he does have such a distinct like relationship and the way that he kind of quips back and forth with everyone. So yeah. that was fun to see. Another big one was... Um, Maddie being pregnant, going through her pregnancy, and yeah. her and Caleb moving to Las Vegas and moving back in with Janelle mm-hmm. during the pregnancy mm-hmm. and them trying to go to school. Yeah, and that was because of a, well, not only, Lots of but a, yeah, there was a lot of factors into why they were moving back to be with uh, family or closer to the Brown family anyway. One of those big factors was the fact that Caleb actually had some pretty serious medical concerns. Yeah, pulmonary embolism. Like, at his age, it's just crazy. So, so sad, so scary. Glad that he's all right. Uh, Watching, you know, Maddie giving birth and she was in labor for like five days, wasn't Mm -hmm. it? Or something started Monday and had her baby on Saturday. Oh my gosh, my heart went out to like her so bad because... I feel like, especially for your first baby, you have no idea what to expect, right? Right. And then when it ends up being like that and all the moms were like, this isn't how it was for any of us. So like everyone was just like, what is going on? Sheesh, yeah. That that was tough to watch. I mean, man, giving birth can be a dangerous thing. I'm not saying it always is, but... And then doing it at home, which I think, I mean, I respect the choice of every person, whether they want to have the baby at home or in the hospital, whatever it might be, it's, it's their special time. But man, it's just a scary thing sometimes when you you never know what could go wrong. And just the fact that it took so long, like the actual in labor process for Maddie was so long. I was becoming very concerned as the episodes went on. Uh, yeah, talking Sam, about what might happen. Yeah, Sam has a little bit of a trauma yeah. from when I gave birth to our daughter. So my first pregnancy and things going not well and emergency surgeries mm. to save my life type stuff. So I feel like whenever whenever Sam and I watch anybody give birth, we're like holding know, hands and like crying through it because we're like, they're going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah. So it's it's so tough. Yeah, it's tough to watch and it's. Yeah, it's just a scary thing, you know? I mean, it's kind of crazy that in the year that we live in, in our day and age, that it still can be so dangerous to give birth. Yeah. So, so kudos to all, hat off to all the moms out there. You're <laughs> you're amazing. It, I cannot imagine. I always joke and say, if it was up to the man to give ch- to give birth to children, there wouldn't be any children <laughs> because <laughs> I I cannot imagine. I just cannot imagine. Yeah. So we're very happy to see Maddie have happy, healthy baby boy. Everybody was fine and and healthy and happy. So that was great to see. And then through the birthing process, there did end up being drama between Mary and the other moms, which got brought up because an underlying theme throughout this entire season as well is still issues with Mary feeling a part of the family and them wanting her to be more involved in the family and her and Cody, you know, over and over just that they have a platonic relationship and that... There's nothing more, but they want to work on it. But then do they really? Because they seem like they're kind of over it. I feel like Mary would be a little more open to fixing it. But I don't know. I mean, they both talk about how it's been broken for so long and they've been kind of faking it and just trying to get through it for like 10 years, which I can't imagine. I think you can only get away with this kind of like neglect towards a marriage in a polygamous marriage. In a monogamous, they would have been divorced like years ago that's that's what was it cody or mary that said that that if if this was a monogamous marriage it was just me and mary or me and cody that we would have been divorced 10 years ago i think they both kind of admitted that because they would have not been able to ignore it right like he wouldn't have been able to go to three other wives and get 
attention and love and all the other things, you know, and Mary just used to a certain level of like not having a husband around all the time. So I feel like you can just kind of ignore your problems a lot easier in that situation yeah. rather than when it's just a monogamous we know couple, what ha- you can't. Yeah, we know what happens in, in season 18, but even in season 12, it is very obvious that there is no romance left in the relationship between Cody and Mary. It's just not there, no. especially when Cody talks about it. He is absolutely not in love with her in a romantic type of way. No, and yeah, I mean, they both just kept saying over and over that they were finally being honest about it, right? right. So I think it had been that way for super long time and now they're just willing like they're like we're not even gonna try to pretend like it's this happy hunky dory thing yeah. like i think when um i think in the tell all the interviewer was like why don't you guys go on a weekend getaway and they're both like no especially cody i mean i think mary looked like she'd be kind of open to it but cody was like it's not gonna help anything like we aren't like that with each other so why right. going on a weekend getaway with someone that you're just why would you go with, like, yeah why would you do that yeah. you know? why would you go on a romantic getaway with someone you don't like basically yeah so i mean i can't even say this is the beginning of the end because this is like the middle of the end like it's been going for a long time the fact that i know that there's like two seasons a year so like until season 18 we have what another three years i'm honestly like a little surprised it even kept going for three years more after oh, this. Oh, geez, yes. I don't know how. I mean... I think the guilt, I think because of the catfishing stuff mm. and because she said, I'm not going anywhere. Like everyone thought she was going to leave then, right? Which was a year before that. I feel like she's only staying to prove that she wasn't going to leave. Well, I told you I wasn't going to leave, so I'm going to stay. I told you I wasn't going to leave, so I'm going to stay. But at the same time, it's like, it seems to not really have a point in her staying other than I think she is trying not to like prove everyone right. Well, it, it was interesting to me as well that when asked by producers or camera people, why are you staying in the marriage then? If it's not working, why stay? And she always responds with, well, for the family. It's always been interesting to me that she doesn't ever respond with anything religiously. You know, because of the religion, because it is a commitment between me and God and Cody, not just me and Cody and things like that. I would expect to hear more based on the the way that they were married and the, the importance of their sealing through their religion. I, I don't know why I just would expect more of that. I think she says that more in season 18. Oh, does she later? Yeah, because in say, season 18, yeah, I want to say right. she refers to the religion a lot more, which kind of tells you where things are at, at this point. I think she still feels like she wants relationships with the kids. There's still a lot of kids at home. So even though she's not super involved, she's still around for family gatherings. There's still new kids being born. There's the first grandchild being born. There's all these other things that I think still being around for that family unit. But then in season 18, by then, the like family unit's completely broken. So then what does she have left to stay for other than commitment to her religion? So I think, at this point, she probably still feels like there's some social aspect to it of being part of the family. And then yeah. that's going to go away and all she has left is like her ceiling. It's a good point. And then within the family, there's like all these dynamics where she's saying she wants to stay for the family. But then she's still having like conflicting issues. Like at one point, and it was clear in the beginning of this season, she said that the fact that like Robin and Christine getting closer was like making Mary really sad. Mm. And Robin's business not including her anymore. When Robin makes it sound like, you know, Mary said she was going to go to school. And I remember that episode. Oh, yeah. Where Mary was like, I'm not going to be able to. Mary stepped away. Yeah, Mary stepped away, right? And so, and then yet Mary's sad because, you know, Robin has this other thing without her. And now Mary's a LuLaRoe consultant, which was so funny. So I called this like before because as I watched the clothes that she was wearing, for anybody that doesn't know what LuLaRoe is, it's an MLM clothing company that was huge in Utah. They've been sued so many times. I'm, sh- I'm sure they're still around, um, but they have had like lots of scandal and stuff. But there are so many people in Utah, like that every single ward, yeah. like church group that we were in 
had like at least one, Mm -hmm. you know, like every single word has like a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, and a LuLaRoe consultant. (laughs) (laughs) Like there was a lot. So anyways, I started seeing like her clothes changing. I was like, oh, I bet you that's what her like clothing business is. And, uh, and then later seeing that Maddie was working for her as an assistant and stuff. But anyway, so there's all this stuff like separating her out from all the rest of the family. And then things like Maddie's, Maddie giving birth, right? Mm -hmm. She was trying to be involved. She knew she was invited. Honestly, like watching the cameras roll it back at the tell all, it was literally like they just missed each other. Like all the other moms go home to go check on their kids. Mary comes back and the house is like quiet and the door shut. And she was like, okay, well, I'm not going to just like go barge into a quiet and like a quiet room while someone's laboring. When she came back from picking up her child from the airport, at that point, all of the moms were in the room and it was happening at that point, I believe. No, that's what they were showing on the camera is that it wasn't. That was like the half hour that they were trying to let Maddie get some sleep. And the moms had gone to go check on their own kids like at 920 or whatever, like they showed. And it was literally just like there was action in there. They said, "Okay, nothing's going to happen. Then Janelle called the other moms back. The other moms came back and then it was happening. Anyway, just like tons of miscommunication. And just one more time where Mary's feeling like nobody called her back. (laughs) But they're like, but you could have been here the whole time being involved and you chose not to be here So where's that line of like, who's responsible for that? It's an awkward situation with Mary because it's one of those things where I feel like we've all been in this this situation like this, not to the extent that she is, but where you don't feel like someone wants you there enough to just go barge in and say, hey, here I am, you know, I know you want me here, yay. Uh, But even, so even though you're invited, if you go and there's no one there, you don't feel comfortable enough to just go, searching around the house or walking into a closed door like like some of the other moms might have felt comfortable doing she Mm -hmm. didn't feel at that point with the other moms to just walk in yeah and there was a certain cover i mean she's walking into the house and they're asking hey where is everybody and it's Mm -hmm. completely quiet right so it's really interesting and then christine Mm -hmm. sits down mary and is like honestly when you do walk into the room it comes with baggage and she goes, yeah, we thought of you, but then who's going to take extra effort to like invite you in if it's going to make it more awkward, right? And that whole conversation was, was kind of a yeah. dumpster fire. Christine definitely didn't and she had, Christine admits this later in the tell all, but like it definitely didn't start off the right way that Christine wanted to. Like it started off pretty bad. I think she had good intentions. Yes. Christine had good intentions. By I, the end, it was almost there. Right, right. It was just hard to express feelings I can't imagine trying to express feelings to another wife that is married to your husband, right? Like the the, yeah. the idea of the camaraderie and, and great relationships between wives, I mean, I'm sure everyone can agree how difficult that would be at times, right? Yeah, well, and how do you start off a conversation when the whole point is like, I feel uncomfortable around you, mm-hmm. but I don't want to. So how can we make it so that we are comfortable around each other. Like that's just an awkward topic to have to confront because I feel like in the normal world and normal society, like if you feel uncomfortable around someone, that's kind of your sign and clue of like, I think I'm not going to be around that person. They make me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then when you're stuck or like family members, I guess extended family, sometimes that can happen, right? You go to Thanksgiving and you're like, this isn't going to be that great because there's that one person who takes the air out of the room and you're stuck because you're family, Yeah, you know? And, but most times like an extended family it's only a thanksgiving the whole rest of the year you have (laughs) but then in this like you're gonna have to be around that person all the time and so i think christine's trying to clear the air because of the fact that they are supposed to have a good relationship but but at the same time they are choosing not to be around each other and that so they'll even hint at the fact that oh yeah we don't see each other very much once in a while i think back on my childhood and how the mothers were always in the home at the same time so they were always around each other. It was like one big family. And I always used to say, oh, well, if the Brown family had only stayed within one family instead of trying to separate themselves, maybe things would have worked out. But I'm starting to realize that it wouldn't have worked out. It would have made things probably worse because of the personalities that the wives have, mm-hmm. that they just they just don't get along. They're not good friends, in, you know, good enough to be living in the same house, sharing the same kitchen, that kind of thing, like like the moms in my family were. 
Yeah, even when they went to lunch. Oh my gosh, it was like the most awkward <laughs> thing. Christine's like, we're going to go to lunch. And she's like trying to be like chipper and cheerful and and try to get conversation flowing. And it was the most awkward thing to watch. I can't even imagine being there. Like it was so, so, so awkward. And Christine even yeah. talked with Mary about that. Like I would ask you, hey, you seem upset. Are you okay? But I don't feel like you would even be comfortable sharing or you wouldn't share anyway. So why would I ask? You know, so... Lots of interesting dynamics that way. You can definitely see, I feel like it's just being more and more open and honest about where everybody's conflicts with each other lie. And then at the same time, so we've seen season 18, right? And we're trying to watch like care, I don't want to say carefully, but at this point, I'm still so confused how like Christine and Robin, like how does it end up being like the whole world against Robin Well, at this point? In season 18, it doesn't really seem like Christine hates Robin. It seems like the falling out was between Christine and Cody. Of course, because Robin chose Cody's side, that makes her a bad person as well. Not a bad person, but on the bad guy's side of things because she's with her Cody. Her husband, yeah. <laughs> but... Honestly, and I know that everyone is going to hate me for saying this. <laughs> I, I even said this uh, towards the end of this season 12. I said, I still don't quite understand why people hate Robin. Uh, based on the show, based on everything I've seen in the show. Yeah, we're not talking tabloids, all the extra stuff. Because there's a just... thousand billion rumors out there about yes. every person that's public. And and so that yeah. that's one thing. But based just on the from show... The show. Why do people watch the show and hate Robin? I don't understand it. I really don't. At least not so far as season 12. And at this point, like uh, Garrison came home from Arby training and he just wanted to hold Ariella so badly. And I'm watching like the relationship between the kids and like the older kids being together or the younger kids being close together and doing stuff. And in season 18, the kids are like, oh, they never accepted us, like Robin's kids. They never accepted us into the family. And everyone always had this stuff against me. And I'm like, okay, mm. again, the cameras are not on all the time, so I cannot speak to the rest of it. But it definitely, like, it, it just doesn't seem like Robin and her kids are not accepted or that everybody hates them and excludes them no. or doesn't want to be around. Like, it just in, doesn't in seem fact, that way at all. So fact, either they're really good at faking it or... And that that maybe, maybe there's some faking going on there, but like Christine and, and Mary, uh, I can't think of right off the top of my head with Janelle, but possibly even Janelle, uh, none of them have, when talking about Robin, it's all been that she's this very kind, loving person that accepts everyone as they are and that she's trying to keep the family together. And it's all kind of positive up to this point about Robin. Yeah. I mean, of course, there was this, there was this jealousy. jealousy and the struggle, but not because of Robin, because of the, the fact that Cody was giving her so much more attention, which that's not Robin's problem. I mean, at least I know they had a longer honeymoon, but who's to say that that was Robin's idea? I, did it say that it was Robin's idea to have I a, remember Christine being like, did you need that? And Robin was like, yes, I did. And Christine was like, okay. That's so, true. But again, I'd say that goes back more to like marital jealousy, not the, like as the way they're being treated in season 12. Like I think a lot of that has been worked through other than the fact that Mary was always close to Robin and now it seems like Mary and Robin are kind of separating a little bit or Mary feels hurt by the fact that Christine and Robin are getting along well, which it makes sense. And we've said this before, but like when your kids are the same age, there was a reason why Christine and Janelle have always been closer. Christine watched Janelle's kids while she worked. They have similar age kids. You add Robin in the mix. And even though that was like really hard transition, especially for Christine, then now there's new babies and they're the closest ages to Christine's youngest. And like, it's going to make sense that you're going to bond with the people who are in the same position as you. Yeah. Unfortunately, Mary doesn't have anybody that's in the same position as her, right? So she doesn't have anyone to bond with in that way. Right. You know, so it's just at this point in season 12, I'm just like, how do we go from here? Like these next six seasons must be a crazy train ride because how do we go 
We can see where Mary's going to end up out of the family. That makes sense. That started. We're also starting to see in this season, Cody turning into the grumpy pants that he is in season 18. Uh, I noticed it pretty obvious that he is now turning into that, speaking a little bit softer and just not really smiling. And just the way he talks is now, It's you can see it's a lot more sober, less excitement about life, things like that you can start seeing in Cody's face as well. But still, how are we going to go from this to, I never loved any of my wives except for Robin. Robin's the only one I've ever loved. No one's ever accepted Robin. No one's ever accepted her kids. I've never loved any of my other wives. Like, I'm like, okay, so either a lot happens in these three years, these next six seasons, or Cody's a liar on either side, either now or in the future. Yeah, I, it's hard to know what's what and how it all comes to be but i think there has to be some lying in that there has to be some lying on one end or the other because it sure seemed like he was at least trying and that there was if there was no love in the beginning of these relationships then wow that was quite the acting going on for many many years and yeah. so, but either way, to, to say that to someone that you spent so many years with and had so many children with, that alone, I don't care what your feelings are, that's just not okay to say that about someone. Yeah, so it's going to be an interesting ride to see how that unravels yes. into that. And Mary continued to be a very big topic throughout this whole season in so many ways, right? Her relationship with her child's getting better bringing their girlfriend home and getting to, man, just watch how Mary's trying to handle that, going to the Women's March, Washington, D.C. Trying to be Janelle, very supportive. Trying to be very, very child, supportive. Yeah. Yep, all that. And then Mary, throughout this whole season again, wanting this bed and breakfast in Parowan. Well, it's been an interesting transition throughout this season because it started off her presenting this was, you know, my grandparents' house, great-grandparents, and I've always wanted to run a bed and breakfast. And Christine's like, and I've always wanted house, to run one yeah. too. And so that makes sense. And then by the end, she's like, I don't want to run a bed and breakfast. And I just want the house. I just want the house. And I want my mom to live in it, but she doesn't want to run a business either. But we're going to pay for it like it's a business. Like, I don't know. It was just so... Uh, it was so much talk. Yeah, it was so hard to see so many times throughout the season. It was a very big topic throughout the entire season. And, you know, basically it started out with her wanting to convince the other wives and Cody that, you know, this be could a be a business. This, this could help bring in some income. And that is why we're going to be spending twice as much as it, the house is worth in order to have this business. And then turning into, no, I just want it. And it doesn't matter what you guys say. I just want it. And, and it's not going to be a business and it's not going to bring in any income for the family. Uh, I mean, I get that there is the sentimental value there and that the fact that it was owned by her family and, and the, just to want it. Yes, that's, I feel like that'd be awesome. But I mean, man, I, unless there's some secret money coming in that I'm unaware of to spend twice as much as the home is worth with that big of a family to help support and be a part of. I, I don't know. It just seems like she wants what she wants and she's going to get what she wants kind of attitude. I think Christine said it pretty bluntly, but I definitely agreed with Christine in the sense that she was like, it's dumb to just try to buy a second home for your mom to live in mm. when our family has so many kids to put through college. We still have like babies. We have a first grandbaby. Like there's the whole rest of the family and Mary is like just so focused on this is what I want. And to say that you still want to be a part of the family and yet trying to do something that is obviously, not that she can't do stuff for herself, that's not what I'm trying to say, but Christine was like, this is dumb. Like it doesn't make sense for us as a family. Why are you even including us in something that makes no sense for our family? We have enough children and family to provide for that it now is not the time for us to buy houses for our mothers to live in like houses that aren't necessary right and such big houses it's like a four-bedroom house and then it would just be her mom because her mom didn't want to live in it with anyone else right and mary's in a big house all by herself in las vegas 
And now they haven't got they haven't got to the purchase time where they like actually give the money for the home. So by the, even by the end of this season, she just signed a, an agreement between the, the, price. the home, the homeowner, current homeowner and herself just to say, Hey, this is, you know, I agree on this price, but it doesn't really ever say exactly what that price is. Uh, it also doesn't give a whole lot of backstory on if her mom is going to help financially support it or pay some or any of that. It doesn't really get into the finances. So I guess I can't really say, how dare you, Mary? Uh, also considering that Mary doesn't really feel that she's a part of the family at this point. So of course, she's going to want something that is special for her at this time. Because even when the wives in the tell all, when the wives are trying to understand Mary more and, you know, why don't you feel that you can be a part of the family? Why do you feel like you have to be away so much? It always kind of comes back to Cody. And the, the fact that they don't have a relationship makes everything else around them so awkward. When Mary sees happy wives and happy children, and then, and then she just doesn't have that with Cody. It, I can understand that being almost just to the point where you'd be so frustrated that you, would, you need an outlet. You need something to focus mm -hmm. your time on. I can see where she might be coming from, you know, and wanting that house for that purpose. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, eventually, she's just going to end up being there more and more and more until she leaves, right? Right. But I think at this point, it almost already feels like it would, all the wives know, like, oh, if you're buying that house up there, it's because you intend on being up there and not being part of the family. And it just seems like it would have made more sense to just be like, you know what, I'm going to go do this thing <laughs> and just leave. But yeah. That doesn't come around for a little bit longer. So we'll see how we'll that see. all unfolds. Yeah. Um, the polygamist march in northern Utah was very interesting because um, obviously we lived in Utah before. Sam grew up in Utah. I grew up in Utah. And watching the protests, um, we saw people that we've had on our channel protesting with the browns saw and we saw familiar people, faces and we saw people that have been on our channel that were protesting the protesters <laughs> and trying to be all for the polygamy bill yep. so it was kind of funny to watch that unfold obviously it's such a huge topic and there's not like an easy answer to it because sam and i were talking about it more so just to give a timeline and to give a little bit of perspective into you know, the Browns were talking about their lawsuit that they filed against the state for the state coming after them for polygamy. It got dropped by the state because the Browns no longer lived in Utah. So they're like, we don't even need to hear this court case. So it got thrown out right when it went to the Supreme Court. So the Browns obviously are feeling very frustrated by how all of that went down, how they had to leave the state. They had targets on their backs. Now, when they were leaving, it was what, 2010, 2011, 2011 when they moved think, to I Las Vegas. So. Yeah. Just to put into perspective what's going on, like what the temperature in Utah is around polygamy, Warren Jeffs was arrested in 2006 and put in jail in Utah, okay? Yeah. He was sent to Texas in 2011 because in 2008 is when the raid happened. And in that 2008 raid is when they found all this documentation about the child abuse, about the heavenly sessions, about all the sexual abuse that was happening from Warren Jeffs. And he was sent to Texas in 2011. Okay, so he's like jail hopping. They're learning more. I think I've said this before, but like I grew up in St. George, which is like 45 minutes outside of Hilldale. And we kind of all thought in St. George for a long time that, you know, they're just our polygamous cousins. They're just a break off from the LDS, mainstream LDS religion. People should just leave them alone. Let them live their religion. They're not hurting anybody. They're good people, but they just happen to practice polygamy. And it wasn't until like Warren Jeffs, all this stuff was coming to the surface that all of a sudden we were like, oh, there are all these secondary crimes happening, right? Mm. And this is at the same times that the Browns coming out. So I feel bad for the Browns in the sense that they're like, we always get associated with Warren Jeffs and they're like, we don't want to abuse kids and we don't, you know, we want that to stop as well. We think Warren Jeffs is evil. Yeah. So they're being related, but the temperature of like polygamy and what's going on is so heightened because right now they're trying to stop so many children from being hurt in the FLDS. Yeah, the government in Utah at this time and still to this day has a lot of pressure on them to do something about polygamy because 
unfortunately, because of what happened in the FLDS, because of Warren Jeffs and some other evil man that stood up like Samuel Bateman and did things that they, anyway, just awful, awful things. So because of all these things happening, the common denominator here is polygamy. And so there's a lot of pressure on the Utah government, do something about this. You have to do something about this. And so they are just saying, okay, polygamy, bad. Nobody can do, can have, can uh, marry more than one spouse. And so they're putting a blanket statement over it, which I can understand why that's frustrating and why that would cause a lot of problems to a lot of families within Utah that are practicing polygamy. Because there are a lot. Right. There's a there's a, a lot. They said, what, like 30 to 40,000 polygamists in Utah? Yeah, and just Utah alone. And so, I don't know. There is a lot of fam. There's a lot of families and children involved in these polygamous homes that to at least our knowledge and to the official government's knowledge, there's not abuse happening in all of the homes. It's just the information we have on a couple of the groups like the uh, FLDS then there is stuff out about the Kingstons as well specifically yeah and it's it's a, just a tough line I don't know how the law could win I mean the things that they have in HB 99 is kind of ridiculous honestly like it's dumb to say you can live together but if you purport to be a wife <laughs> so you can cohabitate obviously right there's tons of people in the world that cohabitate they are not married they have kids together not a big deal. No mm. one can stop you from doing that. But then to say, oh, but if you call her your wife instead of girlfriend, then we can put you in prison for five years. Okay, that's stupid, right? Yeah. Like the way to try to go about it is dumb, even though their purpose is ultimately trying to protect from these secondary crimes that keep happening within polygamous communities. Right. But then where's the line of? It's not fair to say, well, because there were this abuse happening in this one religious community, now that entire religion or that belief system is now inherently what's wrong with it, right? Yeah. If you started doing that, okay, so now the entire, okay, there's some bad priests in the Catholic church, you know, abusing children. So now all Catholics, <laughs> you can't have priests anymore. Like, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like there's abuse and bad things that happen in every single religion. Right. So where you... Because there's bad people everywhere. There's people outside of religion that do horrible things. And so where's that line of you can't just point at a community and be like, well, y'all believe this one thing, so that has to be the reason. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, statistically, if bad things are happening more and more in polygamous communities than outside than polygamous else. communities... You have to take a look at that. But where do you draw that line? Where do you draw the yeah. line from the happy family that's fine and there wasn't any abuse and the kid down the street who goes to church with them that's being horribly abused every day? It's just, I feel like it's an impossible yeah. thing to try to make laws about. It, it is because they could very easily just cohabitate and just say, okay, well, I'm not going to call you my wife publicly. And a lot of them did that for a long time because they were afraid of getting caught or afraid of being put in prison. The Kingstons do that. They yeah. don't even put the dads on the birth certificate. Right. So they're always living in this secretive society. And because of all the secrets that they are born and raised to, to I guess, keep and to believe in, it makes it easier for bad things to happen when you're already used to so much secrecy. Yeah, I think the main, their friend, the main guy who is kind of putting the rally together, he even said, he's like, mm. it's this, having to live in secret because it's illegal is what creates the monsters. Because then people aren't willing to call on abuse because they're afraid that one of their mom gets taken away from them, right? Or mm. they're afraid to call for other crimes or things that are happening because they're worried about this underlying polygamy. And a lot of them have grandparents that were put in prison in the in the 50s is it 40s or 50s i think it was the 40s okay that you know the state of utah came into short creek and they separated families and they stuck kids in foster care and they stuck them across state lines and that was a thing that they did to try to break up polygamy and so their fears aren't for no reason right, right. this is just their grandparents in right. the 50s oh yeah no i can say for sure i, I lived in fear too that the government would come in and take a rip apart my family you know because of what had recently happened i wasn't alive for the the raids and all of that but 
I, or at least not the raids that happened to the man that were put in prison back then. But the fear of that happening again was very, very real within the community. So I do understand when the Brown family says they were afraid, they had a right to be afraid. So it's just so tricky though. It's so tricky to know how to handle the, you know, are, are you just trying to get rid of the religion or are you trying to get rid of polygamy? Mm-hmm. Because really, the, in Utah, the reason for polygamy is the religious belief behind it, right? Yeah. And so I think that maybe that's the the goal is, hey, let's get rid of the religious belief of this. We have to live in polygamy because along with that religious belief comes the idea that it's okay to have some underaged girls be married off to, to older men. That, that comes with the belief because it's been there for so many years at this point. And so maybe that's the idea is, hey, we don't care who lives with who. You just can't believe in this belief that you can marry as many women as you want at whatever age you want and all this abuse happens. We don't want that. So we're just going to say the only thing we can say is polygamy is illegal. That's the only way we know how to go against this, I guess. Well, yeah, because you can't make laws against people's beliefs. That doesn't really work, right? Except for unless the church leaders accept it, which is what happened with the mainstream LDS church. The Mm. federal government said you cannot be a state if you guys are practicing polygamy. Right. It is illegal. And the LDS church prophet at that point then quickly had a revelation that we weren't going to practice polygamy anymore because it was better for us to be a state. And so that happened. But now at this point where there is statehood, like there's nothing else to hang over these people's head other than the fear of jail time to say this isn't good. But that's what the federal government did years and years ago is that they had a carrot and a stick. If you want to be a state, we're already saying polygamy is illegal. You need to step in line. Yeah. And so, yeah, anyway, super tricky topic. Yeah. I don't know if the law will ever be able to stop a spiritual belief system like the way polygamy is rooted in spirituality. At, le- at least not in a country that values freedom. Yeah, not in a country that values freedom right. of religion. You're not going to be able to. Now, Buckling down on those secondary crimes is really where it's going to come into some kind of action and making sure that they're not getting away with any of those. But again, Mike King would tell you all the time, like it's hard to get into those closed societies to even know what's really going on because they are secretive because it is illegal. I think it was Benjamin that we talked to where he's like, if you just legalize everything, legalize everything, it would protect women more. And I was like, that was the first time I had ever heard that. And I think Janelle brought it up in season 18 as well because they said polygamous women also, if they go to leave their husbands and they're a second or third wife, it doesn't matter how long they're with them. They have no claim on any of their property. They have no claim on anything. Like leaving as a polygamous woman is ridiculously hard because they have to leave with nothing where our laws do set up that if women that are legally married leave, you know, there's child support, which there's child support no matter what. But I mean, like there's, they have access to a piece of their husband's but, estate. Yeah. But I think it was also Benjamin that pointed out, we had a, a Benjamin here, we can link his video above. Yeah. Uh, but he also pointed out that there are laws put in place that if you have, if you have spent a certain amount of years living with this person, and especially if you have children with this, with this dad, then you do get some kind of support if you leave. Yeah, but people have to know. But not know. enough. Well, and people have to know that that's a thing too. Right, true. Right? Most of the time they're not going to. So yeah. anyway, law and polygamy is tricky. I don't know if that's ever going to uh, stop it. I know that now at this point, it's no longer a felony. It's a misdemeanor, I think, mm-hmm. with a fine. So It's like a speeding ticket at this point. <laughs> You're married to more than one wife, here's a ticket. I think it's, I wonder if now they use it more as a way to get into homes for secondary crimes to see what's going on. Like warrants and things like that. Yeah, like, oh, well, we've heard they're polygamous, so there's already a crime being committed, so therefore we can go and check out to see about these secondary crimes. I think that's probably more of what it's used for than anything else at this point. But uh, as they went, you know, Robin became the guardian to Christine's kids at this point. Again, showing both Robin and Christine talk about the fact that their relationship is a lot better. They're a lot closer. And 
They go up. Nothing happens. Of course, they're not being. Ar- they're not being arrested. Yeah. Not a big deal. They go up, and it still gets passed into law. But again, Utah's in a tricky spot. There's always going to be the people in in government that I will disagree with. You know, it's everybody has ways of doing things that everybody's going to either agree with or disagree with. But I personally don't think that the lawmakers and the government officials in Utah are trying to hurt any specific person or any family. I think that they are stuck between a rock and a hard place trying to figure out the best ways to try to help this abuse to come to an end, to put an end to this abuse that's Mm -hmm. happening within polygamous communities. Like, put an end to it, but how do you do that without causing so much other problems that you know people going on the run and, and hiding and secrecy and all of the other things that come along with that and and potentially you know tearing families apart how do you do that and and put an end to the abuse you know like it's it's kind of a really difficult place to be in because i mean me growing up in polygamy in a home with four moms i felt that i had a great childhood I know other families, other kids felt differently, but for me personally, I felt that I had a great childhood and I felt safe. The biggest fear that I had growing up was, well, two things, that God would destroy me for some reason because I, we were taught hellfire and damnation. So, I mean, mentally, maybe I wasn't okay, but <laughs> I felt safe other than the fear of God and the fear of the government, that the government could come in and rip my family apart. And so I can just imagine as a little boy seeing sirens and lights at my house, uh, tearing me away from my parents and hauling them off somewhere. That would be the ultimate nightmare for me, the ultimate nightmare. Even if they were putting an end to other abuses going on, as a young kid, you don't know that. You're just being torn apart from your family. So how do you not tear apart families and still put an end to the abuse. That is the big, big question. That I don't know if there's an exact answer to that. Yeah, I don't think I don't think there is. At least I don't think the state of Utah has been able to find the perfect solution to that because there's still definitely a lot of abuse happening in those polygamous groups. Yeah. And not just the FLDS, within the Kingston, the AUB. We haven't gotten a lot of information about that. It's a little bit different over there. But the two largest groups are the Kingstons and the FLDS, and there is a lot of abuse still happening within those yeah. within those groups so yeah. bringing awareness to it has definitely helped yep that's all we can do but yeah. anyway there were a couple other things that we found interesting that we'll quickly touch on is you know isabel's scoliosis watching oh. the exercises work that was heartbreaking that was We'd a tearjerker i yeah. actually it's almost embarrassing to say this but i was actually crying with her in a sister wives show i was yeah. i was actually tearing up yeah when she's talking about how hard it is right yeah we were both crying <laughs> yeah no i'm not i'm not saying it's embarrassing because of her because what she's dealing with is so sad and so real i just can't imagine as a young girl going through that and and not knowing you know for the longest time there was just no hope basically i mean it was like you know i'm going to just have to get this surgery that is going to affect my life forever yeah one thing that when she you know was talking about scoliosis in there just talking about isabel in general and how strong she is one thing that kind of broke my heart a little bit is they said that she was you know oh well isabel's always been stubborn when she was little she was so stubborn because She just would want her dad all the time. And she was just so stubborn about that and made my life so hard, Mm. Christine said. And Sam and I looked at each other and I think you're the one who paused it. And you're like, I can't imagine my child being called stubborn because she wanted time with me. Yeah. Yeah. I remember it was. It was so sad. It was just an an eye opening thing. Yes. I remember pausing it and saying. One of 18 kids would actually look like. Like this. This is actually the first time that I fully felt that I, I felt that I could fully feel for the kids in this family and how hard it must have been to not have their dad around. And and I look at it more in me and my kids now because, of mm-hmm. course, you know I have a lot of brothers and sisters as well, <laughs> and a lot Just more a than a lot more than eighteen. Uh, but yes, it probably would have been a, a, a lot better to have a closer relationship with my father. And I and I do understand why I didn't because of the family dynamic and the work and all the stuff, but. 
But at the same time, I, I feel that I did see him around a lot. I saw him around a lot. I, mean, I didn't because have... he came back to the same home that all the kids were living in. Exactly. I didn't have the kind of relationship that I could walk up and say, hey, dad, you know, let, let's go out and throw a football. Or, you know, he, there was just too much going on. I was the... I don't remember exactly, but the 20-something in line child. At that point, he probably didn't have any, any energy left to even play <laughs> with any of us. No, but he actually did try. I, I will say that. My father tried. We, we tried very hard to always have family home evenings, as we called them, on Monday evening. Mm -hmm. We would get together as a family. We would play games. I remember playing games with father where he would, uh, there's this, this old game that back in the day they would play and specifically talked about in Joseph Smith's day where there's a stick and you, you hold on the stick and you put yep, your feet, feet together, together and you try to pull the other person up. I remember, Pioneer game. Yeah, I remember playing that with my father and um, the other boys. And, and you know, we would play family games. We would do things together. We would go on family vacations. Not everyone together. That was just too many of us. But in different age groups, we would go and do things. I think he tried really hard to have a relationship with all of his children, even though the family dynamic being so large would make that very challenging. But at least I could see he was trying. Yeah. And that's kind of just the reality. I mean, I all the time watching the Browns just think, I can't imagine being like a single mom for three days, you know, every, three days, and then you get to have your husband home for one day, and then three days gone. Well, I guess Mary's kind of out of the loop now, so it's probably two and one. But still, like that alone, to not have the constant like attention of your husband for you and your children, I just think would be extremely, extremely hard. Yeah. So my heart definitely feels for them, feels for the kids. Every once in a while we have those little glimpses. I think it was the tell all in season 11, right? When they said like the kids will say, Oh, you love them more than me. Mm. And that broke our hearts too. Like there's these little glimpses that even though they try to do things together as a family, like how can one man split his time between that many children and wives and wives that aren't happy because that takes a lot of energy. When things aren't going well in a marriage, it is draining, right? And yeah. so, I don't know, like you said, we started seeing Cody's smile go away this season and getting more solemn and just kind of beat down is what it feels like. And by 18, I mean, I don't think you see him smile a single time in season 18. He looks so angry all the time. So yeah. it's definitely the decline of Cody and, you know, it's it's <sighs> just sad, but... Yeah, it just, it just makes you wonder, you know what, Cody, how natural is this actually? You know, because we, we saw him in the beginning of it all talking about, oh, it's just natural, you know, you look at the lions, you look at the rhinos, you look at the other animals in the animal kingdoms, and we're just animals, and therefore it's natural. And now we see him kind of feeling the weight of it all at this point. And oh, yeah. He does not seem like he's very happy with it all. Nope. So if you want to hear more about what it was like for Sam to grow up in polygamy or you want to keep seeing more of our reactions as we're going through our fresh eyes on Sister Wives, then please like and subscribe. Yes, thank you all so much for being here with us again today. We look forward to talking with you soon. Talk to y'all soon.